welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger, and we've been talking about history and its role in shaping a community. Today we're going to continue that conversation with specific reference to the Passover um, and how our identity can be defined. So Greg, as we come to the, the story, or the account rather, of Moses approaching Pharaoh, he doesn't say, let my people go free because slavery is wrong. He asks, or rather he says, the Lord says, let my people go that they may worship me. What's going on there? What's the significance of that? Uh, Pharaoh conceives of himself as the son of the divine son. He is God walking on earth. His um, territory is at least Egypt. And within Egypt, he's sovereign. So here comes the prophet, a spokesman for another god, a god of slaves, who obviously has no standing in Egypt, and says, "Um, I want you to step down because I want to take my people out of your territory and claim them as my own. I want your stuff, and I want to be able to leave your house (laughs) with it. Because I'm the kind of god who can make those demands, and you're the kind of king, the kind of human, the kind of creature, who better obey them. And, and so as we look at this whole story, there, there are a lot of uh, ways we can approach it, but one of them is through the question, who are you? It's mm-hmm. something that Pharaoh has to reckon with. Pharaoh thinks he knows exactly who he is, but by the time we're done, he has to reconsider radically. Moses asked God, who are you? What is your name? Mm-hmm. What shall I tell these people? Mm-hmm. God says, I am that which I am. I am self-defined. I'm absolute. Moses, who is Moses? Well, he is the the spokesman, the prophet of this creator, God. How about Israel? And that's a good part of this. In in a sense, Pharaoh's prop to the story because God's primary concern is with his people. Moses could have turned to them with good justification and said, who are you? What they should have said is, we are the covenant people of God by virtue of God's promise and covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God owns us. We're his servants. We're going to go where he says and do what he wants. We're going to serve him. Unfortunately, as we work through the story, we find out that oftentimes they simply say, yeah, we're slaves of Pharaoh. Can we go back now? (laughs) Yeah. And the Egyptian people too are caught in the middle of all this. Well, they think they know who they are. They too are the servants of Pharaoh and worshipers of the gods of Egypt. But by the time God is done with them, the gods of Egypt aren't worth anything. And so they too have to consider. And a people who no longer knows who it is, is a demoralized people, easily taken over, invaded, subdued, enslaved, which is what happens to Egypt in the end. So one of the things that we can consider here is, and something the children of Israel had to consider, is this question, who are you? And whom do you serve? And whom do you trust? It's a huge consideration, and and it's worth a moment to consider. I first ran into the question, who are you, explicitly, in the late lamented TV science fiction show, Babylon 5, which I will recommend (laughs) at the end of all of this. But throughout the the TV series, there are the powers of light and the powers of darkness. The powers of light are always asking, who are you? The powers of darkness are asking, what do you want? Hmm. And part of the, the, the logic the philosophical logic here, or the the philosophy of identity, the powers of light are insisting you have to know who you are before you can take your first step. You need self-identity. And there's one episode, at least, that's wholly devoted to the question of who are you? How do you answer that question? And and to my mind, the the series does not do a good job with it. Um, We can come back to that. The powers of darkness, skip that. We don't need no self-evaluation here. Just tell us what you want and we'll help you get it. One moves in the direction of order, the other direction of chaos. But since the TV show was written by an atheist or an agnostic, he really never comes to terms himself with these questions. In in his, uh, his sequel to Babylon 5, Babylon 5 Crusade, these questions come up right at the front. Who are you? What do you want? Where are you going? What are you looking for? Whom do you serve? And whom do you trust? And for the last several years, I've had those taped up against one of the cabinets in my classroom. We keep coming 
back to talking about these things. Who are you? How do you, how do you know who you are? Uh, the existentialist is going to say, well, I am making myself by my moment by moment choices. Existence precedes essence. I'm here and now I make myself by my continued choices. But for the Christian, our identity is in Christ. And we're talking about identity. What a wonderful thing to be talking about right now mm -hmm. in the year of the Lord, July 2020, where a lot of people are talking about their identity. God's very clear. And then and the story's very clear because it moves us from, well, we're the covenant people. So I guess God owes us. We're kind of entitled. As long as God does something for us, that's cool. He better not expect us to really actually do anything to stand up to the federal, I mean, the imperial government <laughs> um, or anything like that. But if he takes care of us and, and recognizes our basic entitlement, that's really cool. Just don't bother us or, or stress us with anything. But as the battle unfolds, first of all, the first three plagues that, that Moses calls for upon, upon Egypt strike not only the Egyptians, they strike the Israelites. Mm, yeah. Because sometimes not only does God need to take us out of the world, he needs to whip the world out of us. We need to become discontent with who we are, where we are, and have a mind to where we are going. And so the first three plagues, and, and of course, even, even the initial, Moses' initial counter with, with Pharaoh. Pharaoh does not take it well, and he, make, he turns up the heat on, on the Israelites. You're going to make bricks without straw. It's going to get harder. Yeah. But before we're done, it moves to, so you're the covenant people. You're descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're circumcised. Not enough. Here's the blood of the lamb. You, by household and personally, have to be under it. The general covenant considerations will not protect you beyond that. Yeah, it's great that you're in the covenant. Brings you nigh to the promises. You're hearing God's spokesman tell you what's next. But if you don't put yourself under the blood of the lamb, it's not going to be enough. Mm -hmm. Who are you? You better be the people who stand under the blood of the lamb. Because anything short of that is an insufficient response when God comes knocking and asks us, who are you? Mm -hmm. So when God institutes the Passover, he resets the Hebrew calendar. What's that about? Speaking of year zero and counting from certain places. The, uh, the original calendar, as scripture records, it apparently dated from creation. Rosh Hashanah, New Year's Day, was the day the world was born. And it falls roughly around the uh, autumnal equinox. And had. That, would, that had been the first year. And as far as the civil calendar was concerned, it still remained year one for Israel. But at this point, God shifts everything by seven months so that the first month becomes the seventh month and the seventh month becomes the first month. So good, good connection. I, I don't think I even actually thought of this in terms of our, our, our last conversation. Yeah, God himself resets the calendar. He resets it from creation to covenant redemption. You know, God made the world, but now God is taking on a new form of creation, a new creation by a new covenant. And he's about to rescue his people, redeem them from bondage, take them to Mount Sinai and make them his own in a more formal sense. And so to do this, yes, he resets the calendar and a month that uh, the Bible calls a bib and that or bib, and that the later historians in the Persian era call Nisan, March, April, will now become... Uh, the first month the, the time around the um, vernal equinox. Uh, and so now it's springtime. Spring is now the beginning of everything. Mm -hmm. And the year is going to start off with this greatest of, uh, of ritual meals and sacrifices, this Passover thing, which will hark back to Israel's birth, her redemption, the, the time when God claimed her in a new fashion, no longer as uh, a, a tribal entity, but now as a new nation, a kingdom of priests. And, but God's going to do that in a very specific way. He's going to do it by new covenant, but that covenant here is going to be sealed by the blood of the Passover lamb. And so God institutes this very, by our standards today, complicated ritual. <laughs> there are far more complicated rituals in scripture than this one, but it was not a slight thing. You had to pull a lamb or a kid of the goats uh, on the 10th day of the month. So this took some getting ready. And then you watched it for four days to make sure it was out was without spot and blemish, no flaws in it. And then you would sacrifice it and you would eat its flesh roasted with bitter herbs 
and with unleavened bread. And they were to eat at this first Passover with their shoes on their feet and their staff in their hand as those ready to travel because God was about to move them out. They were going to go on a forced march out of Egypt. This meal celebrated their communion with God, their communion with one another. They're all in this together. Their identity is in this slam that makes them God's people. It makes them God's people. There's, there's a vertical and a horizontal thing here that defines them. It's not just, hey, me and God out by the lake, nor is it this group of people here, and uh, we hope God likes us because we got this religious club going. Mm -hmm. But in God, and more particularly through the blood of Christ, symbolized by the Passover lamb, they are a people united in meaning and purpose with an eternal destiny and a temporal destiny. They're, they're moving along the drama of redemption. This is who they are. This is who Israel is. And so God resets the calendar so they can, be, again, they can be thinking about what all this means. A note I make a couple times, various places, but I haven't really pounded on a lot, is that one of the functions of liturgy is to redefine our thinking. We'll talk about this a great deal more when we talk about the fourth commandment, which is five or six um, discussions ahead. But in giving them this, this ritual, this liturgy that they practiced every year, they began to rethink things or to think about themselves in a pattern consistent way year after year after year. You know, we, we can see this in our Christmas and Easter celebrations, Christmas especially, and Thanksgiving and 4th of July. Certain emotions rise. 4th of July, it's patriotism, Christmas, there's a, there's a hope and a, and a look for the goodness in everything, you know, and, and whatever. <laughs> Some of them are more realistic. There was a time when Thanksgiving actually did recall family and thankfulness and, and worship mm -hmm. and such. But God's, of course, being inspired are infinitely meaningful because he knows exactly what he's doing. He's not making it up as he goes. Yeah. And so in in the the details of the celebration, there's, there's meaning at each point. The bitter herbs point to the bitterness of their bondage in Egypt, but beyond that to the bitterness of sin, bondage to sin. The uh, unleavened bread says... There's this stuff, this cultural stuff that will grow and spread. You need to leave it all behind. The worldview of Egypt, it's idolatry, the personal sins you've developed that were rooted in playing footsie with an alien worldview. All that needs to leave behind. It's not that leaven is, it's, uh, is a symbol of evil, but leaven is a symbol of that which spreads and grows and can contaminate or bless. Kingdom mm -hmm. of heaven is like leaven. Yeah. The question is, who's leaven? They're to leave the leaven of Egypt behind. In the promised land, they will find new leaven. And so there's that break there, the way they eat it again with their abandoning an old world, a world dedicated to slavery and idolatry. And they're about to pass through the baptismal waters of the Red Sea into a new freedom. But first there's to stop at Sinai to get this thing called the law because the free people <laughs> live in terms of law. And God along the way teaches them how to worship, first giving them a psalm to sing and giving them spiritual food and drink, and setting up a court system and then a house, and then coming down to the house, and arranging palace servants called priests to mediate. So there's a lot that's going in here. God is establishing an identity for his people. But we, and this is something the dispensationalism struggled with in a previous, multiple previous generations. They tended to look at Judaism and say, well, well, they're Jewish. That's what it's all about. You know, circumcision and descent from Abraham and God said the Jews could rule the world someday. That's what it's all about. No, that was never what it was all about. Mm -hmm. Read the New Testament, please. God can raise up from these stones children to Abraham. If we understand their place in God's unfolding drama of redemption, that's such a greater thing and a more important thing. But of course, it also then has an end as it pours into this greater river, which is the salvation of, of the world of all nations. So it's really cool to be that important player who's going to pass the ball on at this key moment so other people may be the ones to score. <laughs> but to, oh, no, I was actually playing basketball over there while you guys are doing soccer. Sorry, missed your game altogether, but hey, I, I'm basketball. You better be in God's game. You better be serving God. You better be doing things the way God has planned. If you identify yourself otherwise with what God was doing but isn't anymore, with what another God is doing, with what you think God ought to be doing, but really isn't, then your identity will be self-destructive because God defines our identity. He's a creator. He's our redeemer. And so the question, who are you, needs to come first. Then what do you want? 
God will give us the desires of our heart. He will implant in us his laws so that we want what he wants. Then we have an idea where we're going, what we're looking for, and we will know whom we serve and whom we trust. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is at least something that we could talk next, as you may be about to tell me about. <laughs> uh, well, there's the, the phrase, I'm not sure of its origins, but it's a Latin phrase, lex orendi, lex credendi, the law of prayer is the law of belief. Um, that refers to the way that your liturgical forms shape the way you think. Ah. That the the law of how you talk about the truth in church or how you pray or how the the words that frame your relationship to God that you say precede the way that you understand it. Sort of the way the way you were saying that the institution of the Passover shapes the covenant identity in in a certain way. Yeah, I, I had that that blink for a moment when I suddenly shifted from what we've been talking about to the 21st century and thought about mm -hmm. modern conceptions of worship. Uh -huh. And ended this sudden, <laughs> oh no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because far too often in the 21st century, beginning in the 20th century, our conception of worship, well, you say we're worshiping. And the average Christian, not all Christians by any means, but the average Christian, I think, would say, oh. Singing. So who, yeah, yeah, you're singing. Music. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. music. Or you're now, watching the people on stage sing. Or, yeah, yeah, and it's got mm -hmm. to that point. You're watching the people on stage perform. Mm -hmm. There's a, a local church in our area whose name I will not mention. They're, they're godly Christian people, love the Lord. But when churches were told here during this COVID thing, not to sing, this is a huge church with lots of money and lots of members whose ministry, as I thought about it, was, was largely, uh, they're big with singing, they're big with, with music. But they said, oh, okay, we won't sing. We'll just have some people on stage who will do some singing. And at first, I, I, I didn't understand that. I'm like, wait, you guys are all about singing. What's going on? You just, not even a complaint, not even a, well, we'll endure. It was just sort of, okay. And it, it took, I think my wife or somebody pointed out to me, but no, remember, their worship service largely consists of people on stage performing, mm -hmm. singing, playing music, and the congregation doesn't really join in, it doesn't sing with the performers, it sort of watches them. And this, this then is a frightening thing. When, and then in, in this whole COVID thing where we are getting used to watching worship services, watching moving images and calling it worship and saying, it's great to be there, almost like in person. No, it's not in person. Mm -hmm. What is this doing to our conception of how we lead the rest of our lives? If the, if the heart of life, if, the, if worship, our relationship with God can be scaled down to music or performance or entertainment or watching other people do th well, we actually been here before. It was called the late Middle Ages mm -hmm. when people went to church mm -hmm. and watched the priest do worship. Mm -hmm. uh, and we kind of had this thing called the Reformation to get away from that and to bring the people back in to worship God and to direct confession of God's truth, singing, praying. We wrote prayer books so that God's people who hadn't prayed for a very long time could learn how to do it again. Hymn books so they could sing or Psalter so they could sing. What is What are these changes in liturgy going to do to us? Will we become more and more passive? Will we think that if we've heard a good song, then we've done our worship for the week? I don't know. I don't know where this is going. And I pray that God's going to turn things around soon. And I think a lot of churches are realizing there's some real problems here and are beginning to put their feet down. But, you know, the, the liturgy... And by liturgy, if anyone's listening who doesn't know what the word means, it's simply the, the logical order of worship. Now, sometimes the logical order is, uh, we just do what we've always done. That's the logic. Mm -hmm. Or uh, what feels good next? That's, that's what we'll do next. <laughs> okay, that, that's, that's yeah. a logic of sorts. Mm -hmm. But you can see already what's governing that. Sometimes it is tradition. Sometimes even in the best of churches, uh, the new generation, I know my girls have done this repeatedly. Why do we do that there? Why don't we do this? Like, um, 
since I'm an elder in our church, it's, uh, well, why don't you go ask the pastor? You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and our pastor is always very good to respond, as are the other elders as best they can. But, you know, sometimes it is simply a matter of tradition. Mm-hmm. This is what Presbyterian Reformed churches do, isn't it? Well, okay, but tradition is not a bad thing. Continuity of the past is not a bad thing. Doing what our fathers did is not a bad thing. But doing what God says is a better thing. And we need to make sure that our traditions do not run afoul of what God actually says. And so when God's setting up Passover here, he's very specific and, and it, it interrupts the flow of the story. We're there watching this great adventure story, this sci-fi story, <laughs> fantasy story with, you know, fire and from heaven and killer locusts and rivers turning to blood. <laughs> yeah, all of that's happening. <laughs> yeah. And then suddenly we squeeze to a stop. All right, you're gonna get you're gonna get to a lamb and you're gonna watch it and you're you're going to call your neighbors. There's going to be some roasting. And you're going to tell your kids this. And it goes on. I, th- I don't have my Bible handy, but I think it goes on for about three chapters of liturgy, of God saying, this is how you're going to worship me now. And this is what it's going to look like in the future throughout your perpetual generations. And only after that do we finally pick up, go back to the, okay, we're leaving now. Okay, the story's back on. You can all come back from a commercial break and... Uh, <laughs> You know, because we're, we're used to the action adventure, but not all of liturgy is like that. Not all of God's worship was really that exciting. I I think, again, something my wife mentioned in some context, I think someone must have been complaining about how long or costly or something our worship service was. And she said, ever tried sacrificing an animal? <laughs> You know, I never have, and I'm sure there are probably some people out there who have. I've talked to people. I generally in my class when this when sacrifice comes up, I ask anybody ever slaughter skin an animal, and usually one or two hands will go up. It's messy. It's bloody. It's yucky. There's gore. Uh, you have to do something with that gore when you're done. You got blood all over and gunk, and it mm-hmm. takes you. I believe the last summary I had was about a good hour, depending on the size of the animal. If you're doing an ox, it's going to be even longer. And there's a lot of, of lifting and carrying and moving. And and the other worshipers are just standing there watching you <laughs> and, and, and we hope praying or singing. But that wasn't prescribed in the tabernacle. There's no command to pray or sing at that point. Later on in the temple, there will be. Singing is important, but it develops slowly. I think next time. We're going to be talking about the Song of Moses. But there weren't that many songs uh, that, that God gave Israel. At this point, it's this sweaty, sweaty, bloody kind of, of worship that's drawing attention to our exceeding sinfulness and that we need blood to cover us. We need death. And the, the intensity and, and the time consumption here that worship should take. Uh, it, it's not a quick 15 minutes in and out or even an hour in and out. It's you're going to be here a while, right? even if you're just watching the priests. That's not to mention the two weeks you spend with the lamb alive in your house, mm. being cared for and examined. Yeah. Actually, the lamb is chosen on the 10th day, but probably, oh, sorry. They, yeah. <laughs> but probably, you know, you have to start finding the lamb. You just don't go out. Hey, it's the 10th. Honey, have you bought a yeah. lamb yet? <laughs> Oh, rats, I was going to do that. I talked to Bob about it, and he was going to have one for me. Oh, I just went by Bob's house. There are no lambs left. Oh, no. We're, how are we going to, you know, you got the lamb yeah. early, if only because your wife said, you better get that thing ready, because we're not having the same problem we had last year. <laughs> right. Last so, year, there was no turkey left for me on Thanksgiving. Yeah, exactly. What's that all about? <laughs> so it, God turned it into a big deal. He did so deliberately. And yet rooted in this is the identity. And the children are expected to ask one day as they grow older, what do you mean by this service? What do you mean by this worship, Mm -hmm. by this liturgy? What is this all about? Depending on how old they are, how close to Jerusalem, they may or may not have come as children. They weren't required. But some places, at least by Jesus' time, somewhere around 12 or 13, the, the young boys going on into puberty would be required to come and attend. And so it'd be a very exciting thing, but they're going to say, this is kind of um, weird. What, what, you know, <laughs> what are we doing here? What do you mean by all this? And it's the great opening. Well, let me tell you the story of redemption. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> yes. And yeah, God, God set it up so that there would be stories to tell. There would be a liturgy to stir up the stories. 
And so that people, again, could establish their identity. Stories. We keep coming back to that, don't we? Mm -hmm. Who are you? Well, let me tell you my story. And the, uh, the first place where the, the questions, who are you, whom do you serve, are actually from Lord of the Rings. Aragorn and his friends are in pursuit of the hobbits, Merry and Pippin. And they, they see riders coming and they, they duck down under their elven cloaks in the, uh, in the grasslands. And the riders roll ahead and sweep by them and sweep back. And Aragorn stands up and says, hey, guys, what's going on? <laughs> what's shaking? A um, little, more eloquent, <laughs> little more eloquent than that. And, and the riders come back and point their spurs and say, and say, who are you? And Aragorn responds, well, let's see, who, which, which is first? Um, yeah, they, they first ask Aragorn, who are you? And um, Aragorn says, first, you tell me who you are. Who do you serve? And, and Tolkien, Tolkien understood this well with his understanding of Christian culture as it had developed in medieval Europe. Who are you and who do you serve or whom do you serve? Are, are, if they're not the same question, they're at least very closely related. Mm -hmm. Aragorn wants to know, do you serve the dark power in Mordor? That would be kind of important to know right now. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, you know, I, I don't really need to know your name so much. You're Eomor. Well, that's great. That tells me nothing about it. <laughs> right. Um, okay. You, you, you serve the king and the king's current status would be, we start talking about ultimate allegiance. Whom do you serve? Whom do you trust? Where is your, where does your final allegiance lay? Mm -hmm. And, um, Ilmar answers the question. No, we're not loyal to the Dark Power. We've never served him, never had any dealings with him. I mean, they're, they're, they're bad. And, and then he turns it back. But who, now, your turn. Who are you? Whom do you serve? And or Aragorn throws back his cloak and pulls out his sword, the, the blade that's been broken and is now reforged. And he says um, this, I am Aragorn, son of Arathorn, and I'm called Elesser, the Elfstone, Dunedain, the heir of Isildur, Elendil's son of Gondor. Here's the sword that was broken and is reforged again. Will you aid me or thwart me to choose swiftly? Story. Mm -hmm. You know, you people know the story reaching back into the second age of Middle Earth. You know about the fall of Numenor. You know the men who came westward. You know the Dunedain. You know the Rangers. You know what's where what's at stake. You know this braid that blade that was broken, that once belonged to Isildur, and now it's reforged. That means I'm the heir. That means I'm, I'm leading a battle. Are you on my side or not? Are you going to take a stand against the power that's in Mordor? But there's a story. He defines himself in terms of a story and in terms of relationships. Here are my fathers. Here's my ethnicity. I come from Numenor. Here's my heritage. I come from Numenor. Here's, here is an artifact, a piece of history that I'm holding in my hand that is more than just a symbol. It's going to uh, knock some orc heads off before too long. All of this goes together to help define who I am. As Christians, we it's one thing to say, I'm Greg, you're Emily, he's David, Brian's elsewhere, where we promise he will be back. We're still, speaking, <laughs> we're still very much on speaking terms. Yeah. He's, he's having fun in Wyoming. But that in itself doesn't say a whole lot. So what's your story? And so we used to say that in an earlier day. Mm -hmm. So what's your story? Yeah. And, and it meant, well, I'm from here. I came from this sort of family. I do this kind of calling. Um, there was a time in American history until fairly recently where the first thing that any American would ask of someone he met for the first time after the name. So what do you do? <laughs> um, People still do that in D.C. Do it's they? the yeah. most annoying DC question, <laughs> especially if you're like a housewife, because then it's like, well, I do laundry and a bunch of other interesting <laughs> things, but domestic scientist. <laughs> yeah. Um, de Tocqueville, in writing mm -hmm. his Democracy in America, noted it as early as the mid 1800s, and uh, Europeans found it very insulting because in Europe at that time. To be a gentleman was to be a man of leisure, to not have an occupation where you work <laughs> with your hands, where in America, you were defined by your occupation. Nobody just sat around and did nothing. Mm -hmm. Even someone like Tom Jefferson, he was a plantation owner. He was a writer. He was a scientist. People did stuff. And that's part of their story. 
you know, where I come from, my roots, my family, who I marry, the children we have. Uh, you know, dad was a banker, mom was a nurse, grandma was a school teacher. All of that funnels in. Yes, I have a name. Oh, that name. Does that mean you're from? Yes, yes, I'm one of those. <laughs> you know, that, that was common enough. We define ourselves in terms of relationships relationship first to God, you know, I'm Presbyterian, I'm Reformed, I'm Lutheran, I'm Episcopalian, I'm Baptist, I'm Mennonite, I'm whatever. That tells you a whole lot right there about who you are. Not only do you serve God, you're acknowledging Jesus, but you're also telling us the flavor. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I serve Jesus in this way with these assumptions about who he is and these beliefs. Okay, well, that tells me a good deal right now. And my mother was this and my father was this and I come from this state all right, you're telling me more about who you are and what I can expect by telling me those things. I do this for a living. I work for this company. I work for the federal government. That tells you something. Mm -hmm. We just did a diaconal, a diaconal examination of, uh, of a young man, whom you've met, by the way. And um, we, one of the, a couple of the follow-up questions were, do you have your finances in order? Deacon should. He says, I have an MBA. Okay. <laughs> Can you keep secrets if necessary, not telling your wife things that she, that, you know, are, 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 are confidential matters? And he, I, I forget the exact, David, you could probably provide this, but I have a TISS, something like that, classification. Oh. <laughs> uh, TS. Clearance level. Yeah, yeah TS. T yeah. And he said, so none of you know what I do for a living. <laughs> I did not say, and if we did, you'd have to kill us. Um, and I said, my 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 girls are convinced they know exactly what you <laughs> He laughed, but did not deny. Um, so even in not even in telling us by not telling us what he did, mm -hmm. uh, government clearance that high? Okay. Yeah. We don't know what you do. Specifically, we, we cannot judge, but we have some ideas. And then who are your children? your children are also says a lot about you. Mm -hmm. These are all relationships, human relationships, relationship to God, relationship to the very land, to your nation, to a covenant a group of believers, the church you attend. When we start defining ourselves, we start thinking covenantally. And God highlights this in this whole Passover thing. Yes, you're part of the covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob by birth and by circumcision, but that's not enough here. In other words, in, in, in Modern American terms, you grew up in the church. That's great. That's wonderful. That doesn't save your soul. That doesn't make you a child of God. You need the blood of the lamb. Mm -hmm. And without that, then we're left with, okay, then who are you really? You're, you're not a child of God. That's not your primary identity. You're not someone saved by Jesus' blood. Then what does that leave? Who, how are you trying to define yourself? Mm -hmm. And right now, with the whole Black Lives Matter thing, we're seeing a lot of people who are caught, well, who am I? Am I white? Am I black? Am I what? Is, is, what? What should Christians be saying here? Well, Christians should be saying they're children of God, and the kingdom of God embraces all skin types and ethnicities and sizes and weights, the two genders that are actually real, <laughs> yeah. um, all age groups. Uh, it's Catholic in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, it embraces people who are cat people and dog people who like hamburgers and hot dogs and who love gourmet food. Who uh, Even those who love country music. Even those who love country music, yes. Mm -hmm. My girls have discovered country music, or at least some portions of it that they really like. I hear a lot of Johnny Cash in the background. By the uh, way, <laughs> by the way, my wife is distantly related to Johnny Cash. So, no way. You know, yeah. So Me. more relationship, more definition. Um <laughs> But the greatest relationships are not those of blood. They're those of faith. Mm -hmm. They're those of covenant. Those who do you serve? Whom do you serve? And whom do you trust? And this, this is something that Israel has to work out. When you serve the same God, then you have a, a common identity. And that means communion and community. Mm -hmm. If you all serve different gods, community is a very difficult proposition. Whatever it is, it's something minor. Okay, well, we all live in the same neighborhood. Okay, that's something. We all buy the same toothpaste. <laughs> um, we, we all wear the same kind of clothing. We all look like... 
30 years ago was we all look like either Madonna or Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> that that's there was a, there was a time honestly where I had to look at, at our this is my previous school I had to look at our students say God Jesus did not die to make you look like Madonna I'm sorry <laughs> but when you start trying to find your identity in these superficial things it's, it's very fragile it's a very fragile bond for community of any time any type and, and and then that again brings us back to freedom the children of Israel had to be willing to follow Moses into the wilderness. They had to give up security. They had to give up their comforts. When they splash the blood on their doorposts, their lintels, you know, there might be security officers out there taking down numbers and addresses. Oh, here are the troublemakers. We'll be back for them in the morning. Mm -hmm. it, it was risky. Just as it was risky for the early Christians to say, no, we will not sacrifice to Caesar. We're out of here. Follow them. Get their names. We'll have troops pick them up tomorrow. The, the way to freedom is a path of it's it's communal we share it with other believers and there's comfort in that but it's not always a safe one mm -hmm. and if the if we have not learned to be free in our hearts there's going to be the constant temptation to turn back to egypt and here you can insert who wrote the song so you want to go back oh, to egypt Keith green yeah, it's yeah. Keith green you want to go back to yeah. egypt fitting question here yeah who are you afraid of do you fear god or do you fear pharaoh mm -hmm. Where do you want to be? Do you want to live in Egypt? Promised land's kind of scary. There are giants. You might have to fight a battle. You could even conceivably get killed. God did not promise a no casualty war in Canaan. But is freedom worth that? Is this, this communal existence within the protection of God and his promises, is it worth all that? Or is personal peace and affluence, as Schaefer would say, is that a much nicer identity? And it's worth noting that the freedom in question is not absolute, but it's freedom to serve the Lord, freedom to do good works in his way. It's, it's not go out and define your own existence and your own identity. You're free from Pharaoh so that you can serve the Lord. And the first major stop is going to be Mount Sinai, mm -hmm. where they're going to receive the Ten Commandments. And God will say, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, let's get some things straight. I'm God, you're not. <laughs> yeah. You're going to serve me. All those images, all those ways of trying to get at God and your own efforts, they're gone. Magic, right out. Let me tell you about the Sabbath. And this is kind of where we're going to be going after the next, our next conversation. The next one's about uh, the Song of Moses. We're talking a little bit about war songs and such. Mm -hmm. Great. We'll get to that next time. Uh, do you want to give us a reco before we sign off? You mentioned before what it was going to be. Yeah, well, I actually have two things because my, my wife, I, my wife's name is Kate. I should just start calling her Kate, I suppose. <laughs> um, it was really great, by the way, once I could start calling you guys Greg and Kate, because <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Ettinger is like 12 syllables, <laughs> and Greg and Kate is so much faster. It's, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I know. It's often right right up there with who are you and what do you want are the, and what are you going to call me now that you're no longer a senior? <laughs> right. Always an interesting thing to watch and see, see what people do, so... There's no one fixed right answer. Anyhow, yeah, um, Kate said, so do you have recommendations ready? And I said, <laughs> <laughs> no. And my, my girl said, how about recommending growing green onions in your backyard? So Yay! I'm going to start with that. <laughs> we have a, a big pot. I don't know. It's like a foot across. And when we brought green, green onions home from the store, we chop off the heads and we put them a little water on the on the counter and they would start sprouting and growing until Kate would say, that stinks, take it outside and plant it. And so then we would take it, I'd take it outside and plant it. And you know what? They grow really great. At least the ones Ooh. in that particular planter have. And so anytime you need green onions for uh, an omelet or throwing into a fish or chicken dish or something, you just go right out and you cut them off and they grow back really fast. At least mm. as I say, in that, that pot, I plant them elsewhere and they're not, as huge but these mm. things just keep growing bigger and bigger so what kind of sun thing. exposure do they get um these are kind of right in the middle of the patio so they're getting a lot of heat from the concrete and they're getting as much sun as anything in our yard gets but i do water them a lot they seem to just okay. drink in water the more water water is automatically converted to onions somehow. <laughs> it's, pre it's pretty fast so that's that's a cool thing more, more of this whole gardening thing. The other thing I do recommend 
for those of you who enjoy science fiction, not otherwise, probably, the uh, television series by J. Michael Stravinsky, uh, Babylon 5. It's uh, five seasons. The fifth season never happened. You can, stop at, you can stop at four. You can almost skip one. What You know how series, television series are. You spend the first season trying to find your characters and how you're going to story tell. Mm -hmm. And then this series does so, suffer from that and from um, the gentleman who was the original lead, who they got rid of. Um, and they replaced him with Captain Sheridan, whose real name is Bruce Boxleitner. He's a great actor and easy to like. But this, all that aside, um, it's been it's been compared to Lord of the Rings meets World War II in outer space. Oh boy! Yeah, if you can figure that out, because there's a lot of parallels and analogs between the the whole. First of all, it starts in the Third Age of Mankind. <laughs> you have the shadows that are moving in the background. You have this species that's, that seem to be angels of light, but are they really? But there's a lot of political conspiracy. There are two episodes, I, and I didn't bother looking up their titles, but they, they keep coming back to me a lot right now. Because when things go bad, Babylon 5, which is a, a space station, huge thing, uh, withdraws from the Earth Alliance. It declares its independence. Hmm. So parallels there to the United States declaring its independence from England, and there's some discussion of the legality of such a thing. How can we do that? We're part of a chain of command. Chain of command idea comes back again. when be, be, Before they actually secede, it's still just a possibility. The president, who has become a tyrant, starts pushing orders directly on Babylon 5 and its, its staff and begins to tell them to do just ridiculous things. And they don't know what to do. Do we obey ridiculous orders from a tyrannical power we are part of the military. In theory, we don't get a vote here. We have to do this. And one one of their superiors in the in the mid ranks calls him and says, "Look, you've read the order. Now, if you've got a problem with this, look upon this as an opportunity." <laughs> I feel like I've heard you say that before. You have, and obey the chain of command. And he can't say anymore. He just leaves it like that. And our heroes have to puzzle through. Did that mean anything? He seemed like he was trying to tell us something, but we don't get it. And eventually they figure out, wait, the president has been issuing direct orders. That's unconstitutional. He can't do that. It has to come through the Joint Chiefs down the, down the, the chain of command. These are all illegal orders. By constitutional standards, we have the right to refuse them. Now the president's going to figure that out and issue them through proper channels, but that buys us time. And so, yes, you've heard me say, look on this as an opportunity. You've also heard me say, obey the chain of command because there's safety there. There's another, I don't remember, as I say, I don't remember what the episode title is. So there's another one that's also very appropriate right now, where after Babylon 5 has broken away from the Earth Alliance, the uh, media want to come and do interviews. <laughs> and because these are military people, they are very naive. Uh um, sure, we'll let them interview us. We'll just keep our, our answers really short and clipped. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> and we see the original interview, and then we see what the media does by slicing and putting things together and rearranging what questions they actually ask. Mm -hmm. And it's horrible. They just they just, they slander them and misrepresent them, but it's a good lesson for those today who believe if I saw it on the internet, it must be real. A good lesson in no, it doesn't. It doesn't work that way. Good lessons in conspiracies and covenant faithfulness and courage and other things. So, if you like it, if you like sci-fi, Babylon Five, you might want to skim through the first season. But after that, it's it's worth your time. So, <laughs> onions and Babylon Five. What do you got? <laughs> All right, my recommendation is a film called Spirit and Truth. Um, it's by Les Lamphere, who's a Christian filmmaker. And the theme of the movie is worship, um, mm. and he digs into the Reformed doctrine of worship. Mm. Uh, the thesis of the film is, who is worship supposed to please? Mm. Um, so we can be excited about, quote, contemporary worship, unquote, with the fancy music and the fancy lights, or we can be obsessed with the organ playing and the very strict non-emotionalism of it, Mm -hmm. And both of those miss the point. Uh, right. It's not about what music you sing. It's about 
who you're singing to and whether you get to define what good worship is or whether that's up to God. So I highly recommend the film. Um, He was involved with the graphic design for American Gospel, which we've recommended Mm. before. Yeah. Uh, He also did a film called Calvinist, uh, which was also very good. But the one I'm recommending today is Spirit and Truth because it touches on themes that we talked about today. All right. Very good. All right. Thank you so much, Greg, for this conversation. It's nice to be able to do it in the same time zone as you for once. We're traveling this week. (laughs) Same time zone, not anywhere near each other, though. Yeah. (laughs) We were trying to figure out if we could do this across the table, but the microphones didn't didn't work out. But thank you so much. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to our financial supporters. Uh, if you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, which is anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. And thank you so much for listening. See you next week.